the seed. Um, what is the theme that you see running through our readings this morning? Unbelief. Unbelief. The Israelites, after all God had delivered them from and had brought them through, they didn't believe. They always kept turning back and wanting to go back to something familiar. Jesus says right here in our gospel, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. It's a matter of belief. Now let me tell you that belief is not something that just happens to you. Belief is something that you choose. Belief goes beyond understanding sometimes. You make a choice whether you're going to believe. You make a choice whether you're going to have faith. It doesn't mean you understand everything. It doesn't mean you get your head wrapped around every concept, every theological concept that's out there. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that you choose to say, okay, I'm going to move in this direction because faith is as much a verb as it is a noun. You're going to move in a particular direction with God. You believe unto salvation. It doesn't mean you necessarily understand your salvation. Now, as we are moving through our history of the world according to God, we have now come out of Exodus, which is appropriate since the very Hebrew word Exodus means the road out. Ex hodas. Ex out. Hodas the road. The road out. And now we come into the history of Israel as they're wandering around and God is beginning to build them into a nation. And he's building them into a nation with them having their heels dug in. Uh, let's say that God is more dragging them into being a nation because this is a hard crowd that he's working with. So today we're working on a Numbers 13. Israel increases and becomes a nation. Now, I'm going to show you in a minute how I tie this to baptism. A brief history. Now, as we go from here, we've been pretty meticulous in looking at, at the, the early history of Israel and Moses going on up on Mount Sinai and receiving the Ten Commandments and all that. But now we're going to sort of put it at warp speed because we don't want to get, we don't want to get caught in Leviticus. The one thing you don't want to do is get stuck in Leviticus. If you ever are having trouble sleeping at night, read Leviticus. <laughs> it will put you right down. Because all it is is just a long list of laws that don't apply to us anyway, anymore. We're not under the old covenant, as we've said before. We're under the new covenant. And all of those meticulous laws that were there, uh, it, it, it can get kind of burdensome to try to go through all those things. So Leviticus is, if I was going to skip a, a book of the Bible, it would be Leviticus. Yeah, but you can read it just to get a reference if, if you like. But here's a brief history of Israel in the wilderness. The people are on the move toward the land that God promised Abraham. Remember God made a covenant with Abraham. He said, with you and your descendants, I'm going to bring you into a land. I'm going to give it to you. In fact, he took him there from the land of Ur into the land of promise. But as you know, the early descendants of Abraham ended up in Egypt. And this had been prophesied by God. They ended up in Egypt. They were there for 400 years. That was the prophecy. They were made slaves. You know the story of Moses leading them out, sometimes against their will. But now they're on the move. They're out and they're on that journey from Egypt to Israel, which even walking with 600,000 men, which is the number that the, the scripture gives us, and women and children, even a slow caravan, you're talking about a two-week walk from where they were to right around Jerusalem there. The people are on the move toward the land that God had promised Abraham in his covenant. They get near, and God has Moses send out spies to check out the land. Now, it's not that Moses didn't have faith in what he was doing, but he needed to know the lay of the land. Many times we know what we're going to do, but we want to peep around the corner as much as we can just to make sure that we're not surprised by anything. So he sends 12 spies into the land, and they come back, and the report is bleak. Ten of the 12 spies that 
Moses sent out, report that while the land is indeed rich, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. All right. Now, that's a nice description. I don't know exactly what it means, but, it, but it's a nice description. A land flowing with milk and honey, and they've got grapes the size of basketballs and pomegranates and all the stuff that they're bringing back. Everything they need is there. Even though they find that that is the case, 10 of the 12 spies report back the inhabitants are too big. Now, remember we talked about the Nephilim back in Genesis 6? Or that, that, that strange verse in there where it says that the sons of God came down and cohabitated with the daughters of men and they created this super race. And that's all it says. It just sort of leaves you there with that. And then this is the next place and, and the only two places that I know of in Scripture where it talks about the Nephilim. But they're obviously a very strong and powerful people, big people. They're found there too. And they say that these inhabitants are too strong for the Israelites to overcome. Now, in a word, what is that? It's unbelief. It's unbelief. God has already told them he will be with them, he will take them into the land, and he will defeat all of their enemies before them. But 10 of the 12 come back and say, oh, we can't do it. Now, I don't know what they had in their mind that they were going to do. You know, where were they going to live? They were in a foreign land. They certainly didn't want to live out in the desert. I don't know what, you know, if I had been Moses, I would have said, so what's your plan? What's the alternative? You're saying we can't do this, then what are we going to do? The truth of the matter is, it's a bleak. The, the sons of Israel hear the report and they are downcast. Now, there arises a rebellion in the camp because they choose to believe the ten that do not believe that God will do what he said he's going to do. They choose to believe them rather than the two that said we can do it. The people start to rebel yet again. How many times have we seen on this journey that the people come along and God blesses them and then they turn right around and they start complaining about something else. You know, they, they were hungry. They got to the Red Sea. We don't know what we're going to do, Moses. We've got mountain range on either side. The Pharaoh's army is behind us. And we got, we got our ocean in front of us and we can't swim. What are we going to do? You brought us out here to kill us, Moses. Moses says, stand still and watch the power of the Lord. He lifts his staff and the, the waters blow back and they go across. They get out. They're hungry. They don't have enough to eat. I'm hungry. God provides them manna. Then he provides them doves that just fall from the air. You know, God meets them at every point of their need because of Moses' faith, not because of their faith, but responding to Moses' faith. And now here they are again. They're right on the edge of crossing over into the land that God has promised them. And now they've decided they would rather not believe. They rebel against Moses and Aaron and demand that the people replace them with a leader not to lead them over into the promised land of God, but to take them back to Egypt. Now, let me tell you, as a psychologist, I will tell you one thing that, that, that I learned early on in my training in dealing with people. Familiar behavior, familiar places are much more comfortable, even if they're bad, than a place where you don't know what's going to happen. I saw this often with, with people who were in abusive relationships. Rather than take a chance and move in a direction of, of breaking that, they would rather stay in the abusive relationship because it was familiar. At least they, they knew what was going to happen. Same thing with these people. They'd rather go back to Egypt than to trust God and move forward. Walking in the Spirit is not necessarily an easy thing. It's something that requires you to repent. And to repent doesn't mean just turn around and go in the other direction. It means to change your mind, the way you think about things. Repentance, metanoia. In the Koine Greek, metanoia. It means to rethink. To rethink everything around you. And allow God to give you new thoughts and a new vision of what's going on around you. Our faith is not a static faith, it's an active faith, and it continually moves us from one point to another. 
And that's what God was trying to do with them. But uh, they would rather go back to Egypt, have somebody lead them against God's will. Joshua and Caleb alone from the 12 spies tell the people that if God is with them, they will prevail against the people of the land. But they don't, they don't buy it. Even though God has said it, they don't buy it. And God judges the people for their lack of belief, their lack of faith in his promise. And because of this, that two-week journey from Egypt to Israel ends up being a 40-year wandering through the desert until that generation dies out and people who will have faith come into the picture that God can lead across. Now, you might ask, what does all this have to do with baptism? Glad you ask, because I'm going to tell you. When we are baptized, or when we have a child baptized, we are basically saying that we believe the promise of God that they who believe and are baptized will be saved. We just read it in our gospel. There are two parts of that, to believe and to be baptized. When an adult is baptized, they're stepping out in faith to receive the grace and salvation of Jesus. In other words, they are professing that they believe. Even if they don't understand it, they're professing that they believe. So they've got the belief and the baptism all in one. But when you baptize a child, it's a little different. When we have children baptized, the people who are their parents and godparents, grandparents, are stepping out in faith that we will allow God to lead us in rearing these children into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now remember, it says, believed and is baptized. Okay? Now, with the children, we take care of the baptism part today. But there's going to come a time when they are going to have to act on the faith that they have been reared up in. Baptism is not magic. It's not some magic pill that just saves everybody when you're baptized. Because like I said, there's just two parts. It's a covenant that we make with God and that God makes with us. And it's not just the parents and the godparents and the grandparents. It is the community of faith that surrounds that child. Those children. We all say that we're going to do all in our power to see that this child is brought up in the knowledge and faith of Jesus Christ as their Lord. We bring these children into the body of Christ to be reared so that one day in the future they are able to consummate their salvation by accepting for themselves that which they have been taught in Jesus. And that comes from the parents, the godparents, the grandparents, and the, the community of faith. It's important. Thus completing the gift of eternal life. This is what we call, in, in, in our churches, we call that confirmation. When they come along and they're confirmed. Now, what that means, confirmation is not a magic bullet either. Because when the child comes, what they're doing is they're basically saying, I accept for myself what my parents and my godparents and my grandparents have done for me. I accept that and I accept what Jesus has done for me. For myself. Think of it like this. It's like giving a child a Christmas present in June and saying, you can't open it until Christmas. There will come a time when you are able to open it and receive it for yourself. But right now, you have the promise. And so that's what we're doing this morning. We're going to take Emerson and CJ and we're going to baptize them into this body of Christ, into this covenant, into this agreement. Because when we have baptism, it's not just the parents and grandparents and godparents and the body doing something. It is also God doing something. God is active in this. He puts his seal upon them and he says, all right, this is my child. In baptism, I like to tell the, the, the adults when they get baptized, and children for that matter. When you get baptized in a public setting like this, which everybody should, you get, you get baptized in a public setting with people, other people around you. Doesn't matter how many there are, but there's people around you. When that happens, you're saying to the body of Christ, yes, I'm entering into this covenant with Jesus. 
But you're also, there are, there, there are others watching in baptism. It's not just the people that are here. It's not just the body of Christ. The forces, the very forces of darkness, the very forces of the kingdom of Satan are also watching. And you know what they see? They see this child belongs to me now. This child belongs to me. He is sealed with the Holy Spirit. And he's going to grow. That's going to be the responsibility of those who present him to bring him up in that Christian faith until that day when he turns and says for himself, I accept this. And then it's all complete. The eternal covenant with God that he has put together. I've told you before that out of all the things I do as a priest, baptisms are my favorite. I really enjoy this because bringing people into the kingdom of God is, is, is the greatest honor as a priest I can have. Yeah, it's nice to, to marry people. It's good to remind people in, in, in funerals that, you know, that God is faithful and we have eternal life. That's all good. But this is special. This is the most important thing. Bringing people into the kingdom of God and joining together saying, we are going to re-experience that covenant that was made with us and we are going to do all in our power to make sure that these kids are brought up in the Christian faith and enter fully into the kingdom of God. Okay. So with that, are we ready? All right. Let's bring the children up.